with recording this session. So welcome to the mid-conference keynote of our COM 2022 conference. We're so glad to have you here with us. Um, we have an amazing presentation coming up for you. Um, as we enter the midpoint of our conference, I did want to remind you that this afternoon we will have discussion groups. Oops, our flower is ate the text. Um, so we have four different discussion groups going on this afternoon based on the voting that happened at the beginning of the conference. Um, the first room will include burnout, handling conflict and difficult conversations and change management all in one room. You'll be able to access that via a link in SCED. If we uh, run out of space in that one room, we will create other rooms. So do not panic, um, we'll get that communicated out. And then our second room will be uh, BIPOC managers only. Um, that also has a link in SCED and we do ask that you respect um, that it is meant for black indigenous and people of color managers or aspiring managers only. Um, so please, please respect that uh, space. And with that, we're gonna get started um, with our mid-conference keynote session. And again, this is a reminder that this uh, mid-conference keynote session will be recorded. There are also closed captions that you can access on the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. So a huge thank you to NYU Libraries for sponsoring our Zoom today so that we can have all of us in a single space as well as for the captions. Um, really grateful to their sponsorship for all of our keynotes. And I'm happy to welcome you to What is Work? Oh, Baby, Don't Hurt Me, Shifting Away from Bureaucratic Practices and Management, which is the best uh, title ever. So well done, y'all. Um, and I'm happy to introduce our panelists, who are my colleagues from up the road at Cal State San Marcos. So today we have with us Holly Hampton and Talisa Matlin. Uh, Holly Hampton is the head of user services and the user experience librarian at Cal State University San Marcos. She earned her MLIS from Valdosta State University in 2018. Holly's philosophy includes ensuring the staff and faculty within her unit feel supported, empowered, engaged, and fulfilled. And her research ex includes examining how this philosophy can be applied and how it changes the experience for library employees and library users. Talisa Matlin is the STEM librarian at Cal State uh, San Marcos. She has a master's of learning design and technology from San Diego State and a Master's of Library and Information Science from San Jose State University. Her research interests focus on applying instructional design methodologies to non-traditional instruction settings. We also have with us today, Yvonne Nalani Mulemans and Lalisa Nataraj. Yvonne uh, Nalani Mulemans has been the head of teaching and learning at the University Library at Cal State San Marcos since 2010. Her research interests include the use of threshold concept framework, to support students' transformational learning and reflective practice in library leadership and management. And Lalitha Nataraj is the social sciences librarian at Cal State San Marcos, and she holds an MLIS from UCLA and a BA in English and Women's Studies from UC Berkeley. Her research interests include feminist pedagogy, critical information literacy, critical fashion studies, South Asians in librarianship, and scholarly inquiry and the research cycle. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to your keynote. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you, Talisa. Good morning, everyone. We're so happy to be here with you. Just a moment while I share our screen. Um, and let me make sure it's here. OK, you should be able to see the PowerPoint now. Let me get the chat back up. Hey, I think I've got everything ready. All right, so um, welcome everyone. We're glad you're here today for our presentation. What is work, oh baby, don't hurt me, shifting away from bureaucratic practices in management. And we're just gonna do our own quick introductions. Oops. Hi, everybody. Before we begin, it's important that we do a land acknowledgement. And as this is a virtual meeting, we acknowledge and honor the original inhabitants of our various regions. A land acknowledgement is a critical step towards working with Native communities to secure meaningful partnership and inclusion in the stewardship and protection of their cultural resources and homelands. Let's take just a moment to honor these ancestral grounds that we are collectively gathered upon and support the resilience and strength that all indigenous people have shown worldwide. We are currently joining you from our campus at California State University at San Marcos, 
which is still home to six federally recognized bands of the La Jolla, Pala, Palma, Pechanga, Rincon, Soboba, Liseño, Payo, Coicham people. It is also important to acknowledge that this land remains the shared space among the Kupanga, Wicham, Kupenyo, Kumeyai, and Ipai peoples. To learn more about this land acknowledgement, we encourage you to visit the California Indian Culture and Sovereignty Center from which it has been adapted. A link has been added to the chat. Next slide, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Holly Hampton. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am the head of user services, user experience librarian at CSUSM, where I've been for almost three years as a tenure track faculty member. I identify as a Black woman. I'm in my late 20s with a brown skin tone, shoulder length black hair, glasses, and a yellowish orangish shirt. I'm a mother to a six-year-old son and two cats. I enjoy woodworking, kayaking, painting, and crafting. And good morning, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with you today. My name is Talitha Maitland, and I'm the STEM librarian here at Cal State San Marcos. I'm a biracial white and Vietnamese American cis woman in my late 30s with medium length brown hair. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a parent to a rad five year old and I love spending my free time at my sewing machine making quilts and garments. Hi everyone, my name is Yvonne Nalani Mulmans. I am the head of teaching and learning here at the Cal State San Marcos University Library. I'm a tenured library faculty that's been here since 2002. I am a white cis woman in my 40s with long blonde hair and I wear glasses. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm the mother of a 15-year-old and 13-year-old and my hobbies include powerlifting and running. Hi, I'm thrilled to be speaking with all of you today. I'm Lalitha Netraj and I'm the social sciences librarian at CSUSM. I'm a South Asian American cis woman with Tamil and Telugu heritage in my early 40s with black hair cut into a short pixie style. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the mother of two boys ages 12 and almost 14 years old. In my spare time, I enjoy staging fashion shows for my Sphinx kitty pictured here with me. Her name is Nadia, collecting art and plants, which you can see behind me, um, and also reading and writing. Next slide, please. All right, um, so today we're going to be discussing bureaucracy and academic libraries viewed through a CRT lens, what we consider benign or neutral before, but has been revealed by the COVID-19 pandemic as particularly absurd and perhaps racist and exclusionary to marginalized groups, re-envisioning what we want libraries to be and reflecting on what we can do to make this vision real. So we would like to establish some expectations of this session prior to moving forward. We will center the experiences of marginalized communities because we believe it's important not to place the burden of educating others on those impacted by the issue at hand. We do not intend to offer quick fixes for racism or other marginalization in libraries. And we hope each of you will join us during the session in both group and individual critical reflection that we can all take back and apply in our institutions. And lastly, we believe it's important to approach this work through a lens of care and intention to improve the experience of others rather than for one's own self-actualization. Next slide, please. All right, let's begin by considering what makes an ideal, those are some air quotes, bureaucracy. These characteristics will likely feel very familiar to many of us. So according to German sociologist, Max Weber, there are six criteria of an ideal bureaucracy and they include authority over specific areas, hierarchies, an emphasis on written documentation and attaining technical competency through training, spending longer time at work than is required and an impersonal and uncritical adherence to rules and regulations. These qualities give the impression of efficiency. Yet what we usually find is that we are simply accumulating more work to accomplish and adding stress. These qualities are also essential parts of new managerialism, which is the application of corporate practices to the nonprofit sector. And in our context, higher education. This is bureaucracy that focuses on the bottom line. And in the corporate world, that's profit. In higher education, the bottom line can be all sorts of widgets. 
donations, graduation rates, program rankings, all of this ultimately results in an environment in which diversity and differences cannot flourish. Next slide, please. Critical race theory or CRT provides us with the framework to critique bureaucracy and is particularly salient because of its origins in legal scholarship. That's because bureaucracy at its heart is intertwined with legal authority and is rules-based. But these rules become less and less clear as one rises within a hierarchy, ensuring that only certain groups, read white, ascend. Now, historically, American libraries have maintained an outward appearance of inherent goodness by enacting policies intended to create an informed citizenry. But in actuality, these policies facilitated assimilation and acculturation into a white culture as a means of civilizing and exercising control over BIPOC. Control is exerted through opaque and irrational bureaucratic policies. And these policies allow libraries to adopt neutral stances in the name of equity, but a CRT critique repudiates narratives and neutrality. Now, one critical concept of CRT is intersectionality, which helps us recognize that we all experience racism differently and in very specific ways based on the complex identities we hold. It is through an understanding of intersectionality that we're able to see how racial liberalism, which is a discourse that embodies a race ignorant ideology, it leads historical inequities. Next slide, please. We want to highlight that as a majority of you are in middle management positions, this absurd and irrational over-reliance on bureaucratic practices and libraries impacts you from two directions, both from the management above you and as a manager yourself, who's expected to carry out specific ways of working and managing the people you lead, whether you have direct or indirect authority in your position. We know this is hard. Trust me, we know this is hard. I'm a middle manager, it's hard. We know this is hard, particularly for BIPOC managers who are sorely underrepresented in libraries, accounting for less than 20% of library middle managers in academic libraries. We hope that during this session that we can all work together to reflect upon and reimagine what our collective futures in libraries could be and some steps that we can take to make change. Next slide, please. Okay, so now the fun part. We've spent the first part of this presentation providing you with some of the concepts that helped inform our work examining absurdity in libraries. Um, there was even one in the chat that was brought up that I just want to highlight that I think Liz Galuz has talked about um, this idea of free time being extra, that it's not something that we, that we don't have hobbies, that our identity is so tied to our job. I think I'm making the right connection there, Liz, is itself uh, an artifact of white supremacy. So, and if we're looking at the, what oh, wasn't Liz, who was it? Um, I can't go back up through the chat very quickly. Um, <laughs> but um, this idea that we are, th that like our jobs are part of us and that we are subsumed by the bureaucracy is something that we all try to break away from. And that's part of what informed how we crafted our own uh, introductions today. So I, oh, thank you, Liz. Uh, Shantae Smith-Cruz, thank you for highlighting that. Um, so, okay, back to what we're gonna do. So we've talked about uh, the features of a quote unquote ideal bureaucracy, which is what many of us work in. Um, if you don't work in a place with bureaucratic structures or practices in place, reach out to us afterwards because I'd love to hear about what it's like. And also critical race theory and how um, this framework can help us examine why bureaucracy in particular and those practices in particular have negative impacts on uh, BIPOC and taking an intersectional approach, how those also intersect with gender, class, um, ability, uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting some, um, but all of those different intersections of our personalities and our identities. So now what we want to give you some time to do is to engage in some critical reflection with us. We're going to ask you to think back to a time, whether in or out of libraries, that you engaged in or were subjected to a management practice that you now view as an absurd or irrational practice that had a negative influence on right workers writ large. 
And as you think about these management practices, consider how critical race theory might reveal how these absurd slash irrational practices can additionally, additionally negatively impact BIPOC library workers. Taking an intersectional lens, how might they negatively impact other marginalized groups, such as those who are LGBTQ plus or disabled or members of multiple marginalized communities? We've sent up a, set up a Mentimeter where you can submit your responses. And Lali, I didn't see, did you get a chance to put that in there yet? Lali's gonna put it into the chat. And you can submit your responses anonymously. We, the presenters, will be able to see what is submitted but not who has submitted them. And we'll use these responses to guide our discussion today. And uh, Lali has dropped it into the chat some of the features that are the characteristics of a quote unquote ideal bureaucracy. When you come up with your examples, we want you to um, identify which bureaucratic characteristic is most at play there. Just pick one, it may be many of them, but maybe just pick one. And then also take a CRT lens to examine that practice. The mentee is in the chat and I think we're going to start with just a few minutes and some of the examples that you think of may seem fairly benign, but upon closer reflection will reveal the absurdity of our bureaucratic practices. For instance, starting a meeting with roundtable reports where everyone reports out on what they're currently working on can set an expectation that we care only about output and force participants to perform work. And when BIPOC workers already feel the need to conform to standards that are steeped in whiteness, they may feel additional pressure to demonstrate high levels of productivity during these types of roundtable settings. So that's just one example of what you may come up with. I've even in our earlier conversations today, I heard many more examples of these types of things. So we're going to start with three minutes to reflect on the prompt at hand, and you can submit your responses anonymously at the link that is put in the chat. And um, at, at the end of three minutes, if there aren't that many examples, we will take a couple more minutes, but we're gonna come back together and do some reflection, okay? And I didn't see any questions in the Q&A and none in the chat, so I think we're good to go with our three minutes. Okay, and I'm gonna set a timer on my phone.
Okay. Um, I'm it's up, I believe. And uh, before we were prepping this, we were wondering is three minutes going to be enough? And we have many pages <laughs> for responses and examples. Um, so it was enough. Uh, I think 30 seconds was enough for you all to, I think you were probably thinking of these while we were talking. And um, there are a few I'm gonna highlight, but also I wanna address the question that's in the Q&A right now that says, as a uh, Bi BIPOC person that enjoys round table sharing at department meetings, how can you turn the goal of sharing what everyone is up to into a less stressful moment? Is it reframing the round table with a comment about no pressure for productivity or not having it at all during those meetings? And um, any of my co-presenters, please jump in. But one thing that strikes me here is that this, I think, is what we're all grappling with, particularly you all who are managers, middle managers, or uh, higher up managers. These are not, like, we work within the constraints that we work in. We are not getting rid of bureaucracies in our libraries tomorrow. And also, there, we don't want to, like, stop communication, right, or stop working. We're, we're here to do work. We're here to, to fulfill the educational missions of our organizations. How can we take some of these practices that may have benefit and re-examine them so that they, they are useful, they aren't um, exclusionary to people that in a way that you may not want them to be? Um, so I don't necessarily have an answer for you, but one thing I would think of is um, coming up with like group norms and um, I am not a manager, so I can't say this necessarily, but uh, maybe having people work on the group norms without the manager there. And I see Holly came off mute. Maybe you wanna address it, Holly? Uh, yeah, so this is something that I do during our team meetings that we have bi-weekly. And for this, I just have an open agenda at the end of each meeting. And during that open agenda item, anyone can share out. It's not limited to just um, our subunit leads. It's open to everyone. They can report out. Uh, announcements, accomplishments, any other agenda items we didn't get to touch on, anything that they have not had a chance to speak to, to the whole team. And I also like what Joanna has put into the chat that it can be a document that people put announcements and sharing into, and that has worked well for Joanna. And I agree with that. So I actually open up the agenda for folks to add anything into it. They can also email me because um, sometimes people just don't feel comfortable speaking as well. They don't want to be put on the spot. So that way I can read their uh, announcement or their sharing piece out to the group. So that takes some of that pressure off. Yep, awesome. And I see um, other people are doing similar uh, types of things in here. And also just thinking about this for any of our, um, if we are, or if any of our colleagues are neurodiverse, sometimes being put on the moment. So having to report out in that instant can um, be really difficult and cause a lot of, I don't know, um, anxiety or uh, uh inability to focus on what's uh, what they want to be focusing on. So um, also considering the many different ways that people approach our work and do this. And I think is, it looks like Lolly is sharing the uh, examples maybe. I'm not sure who shared that new screen. But um, so a couple of examples, you all can look at all of them, uh, but some that were, mentioned many times were, uh, someone wrote about a five page clothing policy. And that to me feels uh, very, very absurd, right? Like how many pages do we need to tell us what to wear? And um, do my other colleagues want to come off of mute and address this too? Doesn't have to be only me. Um, but I'm looking at what bureaucratic process or characteristic may be at play there. And thinking about, the professional standards, like this idea of professionalism and um, how that is derived from white ways of conceptualizing professionalism it can cause, and I think that this is Katrina Davis Kendrick who talks about this, the authentication. So um, these dress codes affect certain groups of our workers more than others. It's, it's easier for some people to conform than others, more natural. Okay, 
Yep, and scout totally. Even neurotypical people vary in their needs and work styles. So flexibility really benefits the entire group, 100%. Yeah. Um, also too rigid clothing styles, too rigid of these rules, right? For clothing, it forces people, it creates barriers to people to be in a workplace. So if you're requiring for, for example, like, oh, you need to wear a suit. Well, do you know how much suits cost, right? Like, are you providing me with the means to get a suit? Um, are you paying me the salary I need to be able to afford a suit after I cover all of my basic needs? These kinds of things that need to be addressed if you're gonna give me a five play, page clothing policy, right? So it's creating an additional barrier. That is so spot on. Um, one other thing that came up many times in the mentee was um, all of this work around telecommuting, how certain people are allowed to do it and certain people aren't based on uh, like class of worker at organizations, um, necessary or unnecessary paperwork to request those telecommuting days. And I think we see bureaucracy at play like so much there, like the form, so many forms, right? Um, and something that I saw repeatedly come up throughout, uh, well, we're not out of COVID, but throughout COVID and ongoing now are um, a lot of people who may experience additional microaggressions in the workplace being at home and not having to be around people who would be microaggressing against them repeatedly. And I even sometimes it's not microaggression, sometimes it's just straight up aggression, aggression. It was easier to focus on our work at home where we didn't have to experience those things than when we were forced to come in with no necessary reason besides, I think someone put it in there, the butts and seats. Um, and one other thing I saw in the Q&A was uh, this, so they acknowledge that it might be a contrarian point of view that we do work to produce. And I don't think any of us here would disagree that we're doing work with a particular mission in mind, um, but how we get to that mission sometimes is, uh, or how we accomplish that mission may not always be tied to the like the numbers and widgets that are counted and valued in a bureaucratic structure. Sometimes it's um, less countable or quantifiable. That's the word that I wanted to use, not countable. <laughs> um, one other thing that came up a lot of times were, and this is a little bit tied to the telecommuting, but lack of agency around scheduling. So um, having to fill up your calendar to like rationalize where you are all the time or what you're working on all the time. Um, and do any of my colleagues want to address that point about the calendaring and scheduling? I'll try and tackle just, that. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Lolly. No, go, go for it, Lolly. Go, I, go I just wanted to surface that um, calendaring, of course, is part of a surveillance culture. And um, something that we came across in our research was um, an anecdote uh, from Allison Green. So if any of you are familiar with her work, she's Ask a Manager. And uh, someone had recently submitted a question related to joking in the workplace. And, um, and we will get back to the calendar example, but this is sort of part of this idea of surveilling what other people do, dictating behaviors in the workplace, what is or isn't appropriate, acting in rational and objective ways. And I guess this person had written in and said that um, they had just started a new job and they made a joke with a colleague. And I guess, and it was a very um, sort of like innocuous type of joke about the copying machine. And before they knew it, they had been called in by HR and their boss and told that this is not how we function in the workplace. We don't tell jokes, we just kind of go about doing what we do. And yes, I agree, Melissa, it was really a wild letter, but it really um, resonated with the four of us because again, that is an example of bureaucracy, the sense of that person was being watched and surveilled and judged. And, um, and also, you know, they're not allowed to be relational in the workplace, right? They have to follow these sort of like rigid rules. And um, Yvonne, I don't know if you wanna get back to the calendar uh, example um, and talk about that a bit more? 
Sure, actually, Lolly, you mentioned surveillance culture, and I thought I might bring up what a major theme in the mentee responses have to do with this um, practice of reporting on your work. So uh, I see a number of mentee responses mentioning that when folks went remote at the start of the pandemic, they had to do daily, weekly, monthly reports of, you know, I'm working on X, Y, and Z. And it's so interesting to me because this is an instance where focusing on the outcomes could be more helpful than focusing on reporting that you've worked on something for X amount of hours. So, uh, you know, thinking about, oh, I'm supposed to put together a brand new guide or a brand new lesson plan. Instead of reporting out on today, I worked on it for two hours or this week I did this part of it. Is the guide ready when it needs to be ready? Is the lesson plan prepared in time to work with the class? And that's, and that's the bottom line, not the reporting of the work. And many people mentioned that the reporting on the progress of the work takes up more time away from actually doing the work itself. So now we're already into an absurd uh, practice. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Yeah, and just one more thing I want to address before we move on. Uh, there was a question in the, so a couple of questions I think that are related. So any thoughts on how to address the opposite problem, which is a lack of necessary structure, process, and documentation, and how to like avoid chaos in the workplace and kind of a, a free for all. Um, and then also one that's talking about um, these things seem to be a matter of personal taste or subjective. How do you navigate these things when everyone has a different expectation of work? And Lolly, in probably more than one of us, but Lolly, I think, talked about it earlier, the relational aspect of our work. So first of all, um, adults, well, anyone, not just adults, children too, we, we need a agency and uh, enabled in order to uh, exist and to, in our workplace, to work in the way that makes sense for us, that helps us to figure out how to accomplish the shared mission of the library or wherever we are. And the relational aspect there and the shared part is coming up with how do we figure out together how we want to do this rather than it being something that's dictated from the top down or even the one person um, from the bottom up, right? It should be a group shared discussion and understanding that takes much, a lot of time to not get perfect, but to get closer and closer to write, to figure out what's working for the people who are in your organization. So to me, it's not no rules, no expectations, no guidelines. It's coming up with shared ones that are considering how it can be inclusive of the people who are in your workplace and inclusive of people who may not be there yet, but who you want to include later on. Yep, co-creation process. Thank you, Annie. Okay, so I think, are we all ready to move on? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Sorry, my Bluetooth mouse disconnected <laughs> the second I needed to unmute. <laughs> okay, so bureaucracy in a time of COVID. You know, with this slide, it's funny, I'm in charge of it and I'm sitting here and I'm like, I feel like we've kind of discussed this already. We must really also consider the obvious seismic shifts resulting from the ongoing pandemic, which has been just so effective in laying bare the historical inequities within not just our work environments, but our society as a whole. To us, it's clear that vocational awe is one of the underlying drives for academic libraries to continue business as usual without examining if our current approaches actually help our users and equally important ensure that our library workers are able to thoughtfully and fruitfully engage in their work. If you're not familiar with Fobazi Attar's now seminal work on vocational awe, we'll place the citation in the chat and it's also included in our references. We also believe that the reticence in academic libraries to remote to excuse me I've, i'm stumbling over my words because i feel like we've kind of digested this idea but it's worth repeating we also believe the reticence in academic libraries to embrace remote work possibilities is an example of absurd and exclusionary bureaucratic practices that the pandemic has been especially powerful at illustrating 
In addition, I think we've all experienced some version of a situation where there are some folks being terrified to work in a crowded uh, space and others being dismissive of those folks' health and safety concerns. And what those situations are most successful at creating is poor morale for everyone. And then lastly, we haven't mentioned, I think we mentioned this just a little bit, meeting frequencies and locations also reveal inequities. What tangible benefits are gained when a meeting is convened in person versus online? And if the best reasons identified have nothing to do with the task at hand, that indicates that there are more likely bureaucratic reasons to play at play. And these bureaucratic reasons most effectively communicate a dismissal of folks' very real concerns. Next slide, please. Okay, so as we mentioned earlier, libraries in the United States have a history of exclusion, reinforcing racist and Eurocentric practices. How can we move to more inclusive management that is conscious of and provides space for library workers varied and multiple intersectional identities, particularly when they belong to one or more marginalized groups? Undertaking this work to become more inclusive managers combined with the historical whiteness of libraries means that we need to devote extra time and intentionality to attempt to denaturalize whiteness in our places of work. If you're a manager, you can start to re-examine re some practices and think about how they have impacted individuals in the past and how they may have had particularly deleterious impacts on individuals from marginalized communities. How can we practice more inclusive management in our places of work? For example, um, perhaps rethinking structured group work, which can often result in a decision made by upper management that is not reflective of the recommendations or feedback that were actually provided by the people in the groups. Lack of transparency, such as who is responsible for what decisions, how the groups work inform these decisions, what are the expectations for people engaged in the group, such as how much time this should take, how people can ensure their perspectives are heard and considered during meetings, whether work needs to be done in person or online, how timelines will be achieved, or how people are expected to incorporate this group work into their existing workload or take something else off their plate can all add to how group work can be demoralizing for everybody, and particularly so for library workers from marginalized groups. For instance, for BIPOC library workers, not only do they have to participate in a process where they have reason to distrust, but they are subjected to being challenged more frequently than their white counterparts and having their experiences and expertise more frequently discounted. And for library workers with a disability, participation in group work needs to be made accessible so that they can fully participate. And again, making this accessible across the board makes it better for everyone working in the library. So how else can we practice more inclusive management in our places of work? Re-envisioning current professional standards that reinforce hegemonic norms may be an example. So many workplace standards that we use to judge whether someone is, or someone is doing good work or something is good work, it's grounded in racism, ableism, and cis heteropatriarchy. So for instance, constant calls for efficiency may reject full discussions or consideration of different approaches that may be more inclusive of library workers and the communities in which we work. BIPOC library workers may be forced to undergo what Katrina Davis Kendrick terms deauthentication, removing or downplaying markers of their identities in order to preempt microaggressions and navigate or be accepted into primarily white workspaces. Another practice to re-envision is tenure and promotion standards. A good example is what Charlotte Rowe talks about where retention and promotion standards can value publication and premier journal outlets that do not provide space for non-Eurocentric research approaches. Another way is being clear in our expectations of people in our workplace. When we're not clear of our expectations or when there are hidden or unspoken expectations of people, which is something that I saw in the Minty people uh, mentioning that there are instances where things are unspoken, right? So that results in excessive interpretive labor. And when there are power dynamics at play, it means that people who have less power, so to speak, have to try to figure out what's being asked or expected of them. And that can result in frustration, emotional exhaustion, anxiety, and so much more. So taking a CRT lens to examine unclear expectations reveals that BIPOC must engage in additional interpretive labor to successfully navigate a library workplace. 
And something else I wanna to speak to is exclusive or selective practices. So we want you to think about how practice may innately exclude certain individuals. And some examples I wanna give is how we may have reliance on policing for safety. So who are you making a safe space for when you do that? Um, who are you putting up a barrier to the space if you're relying on police to make a safe space? or collection development practices. So whose information are you suggesting, suggesting holds knowledge, is worth sharing knowledge of? Um, including like hiring retention practices as another example. So who are you suggesting is educated and experienced enough to be welcome into the workplace, to be brought into as a part of the workplace, as a librarian or as a staff member? Who are you putting effort into ensuring has a positive experience in the workplace? And who are you spending time listening to and adjusting the workplace for? And I don't want to. I also want to bring up student assistance, right? I don't want student assistance to be overlooked in this in this mindset as well. I think that that happens a lot. I do see a question about me repeating the sentence about efficiency and harm. Um, so with that, it's just a matter of costing constant calls for efficiency that can reject full discussions or consideration of different approaches that may be more inclusive of library workers in the communities in which we work. So I know I constantly use the word efficient. I actually tell my six-year-old all the time, like, that's not efficient. I told you to take the plate to the sink and you took, like, take all, like, clean the, you know, clean the dining table. You took a plate to the sink, then you came back and took your cup to the sink, then you came back and you grabbed your fork and took that to the sink. Just put, take them all and take them to the sink, right? So efficiency, you know, I don't want to say it's not important. It definitely is something at least important to me. But if you're calling for efficiency and you're not saying what that means or you're shutting, you could be shutting down or placing barriers for folks who may not fully understand, like, what do you mean by efficiency? And that can go into those hidden expectations or unspoken expectations. Um, and you're kind of closing off discussions that may be more efficient in the end, or just contribute to a more effective end goal, right? So um, hopefully that gets to that question. Um, and then I also want to note that I understand that a lot of this may seem overwhelming um, and it could be best handled when you can re-envision and implement with a team. But I always say that there are typically things that you as an individual can incorporate into your daily practice that may help you to practice these more inclusive management skills in your workplace. Um, it is like very easy to say, oh, well, one person can't do, can't do it all. But if with that mindset, it kind of sets us back, right? So we're all responsible. And I do this, especially with our um, user services team anti-racism discussions is we're all responsible for this discussion. If someone facilitates, I don't facilitate each meeting because I'm not responsible for this discussion. We are each responsible for this discussion. We should all hold responsibility. I don't hold all the responsibility for this. And that that takes place here with this these inclusive uh, management practices. While you know I am a middle manager, I can do what I can do as an individual. And there are things that we can do as an entire library as well. And if other folks are not willing to jump in and do that work, then at least there are things that I can do as an individual to make it happen. Next slide, please. So here we're going to launch into a conversation about what we have been discussing thus far. And earlier we asked folks to identify absurd and irrational practices they have experienced. And our hope is that this discussion has provided insights as to why we experience these practices in this way. So now what we want to do is we want to ask you, what would you do differently as you reflect back on those absurd and irrational experiences? And before we begin our conversation, we'd like to remind folks of the expectations for this presentation. Again, we will center the experiences of marginalized communities because we believe it's important not to place the burden of educating others on those impacted by the issue at hand. And we will not be offering quick fixes for racism and other marginalization in libraries. Um, we hope that you will critically reflect with all of us and hopefully we will come up with some ideas and thoughts together that we can then take back and apply in our institutions. And lastly, we want to approach our work through a collective lens of care rather than for our own individual self-actualization. Um, so I just kind of want to open it, open this up for discussion. Um, Danny, do you know if it's okay if, if people want to um, maybe like speak, like unmute, what, it, what is the best way to, to go about this? 
Yeah, if you all are up for that, we can certainly unmute folks who raise their hands in the participant list. So um, if you go to your participant list, I believe you can raise your hand there, but maybe someone who's more Zoom uh, efficient knows how to do that and can put it in the chat. There's also a question in the chat right now um, that I think we're all working with. And again, this is, so it says how to successfully navigate while supporting work from home and yet not further privileging those whose work can be done remotely. Some work really does need to be done in person and on site. And then Isabel responds to Leah, maybe it's time to change people's jobs so that they can do some work on some days remotely. Yeah, and I, I this is highlighting a couple of things here. So, um, we acknowledge that we work within particular, that there are some constraints to our work and some um, agreed upon things that have to be done, or really it's, it is the agreed upon things that have to be done, the collective work. Um, and how do we go about figuring that out and taking a step back and um, always asking why? Why do we do it that way? Does it have to be done that way? Why? And until you can get to a point where there isn't any more why, then that's kind of the starting point. And I think that Friday's keynote and Helen Peterson, she may talk about this in her book, Out of Office, um, but it's always going back to the why. Like what, what, is the, what is the component here that must be necessary to do? So we do have a hand raised um, from uh, Andrea. So let me give you permission. Thank you. Um, so I'm a head of access services at a research one institution. And while I have made huge efforts to create flexibility for my staff and allow them to shift and do, we have a, luckily a subscription to LinkedIn Learning, so I have assigned them to do those kinds of things to allow them to work from home. The reality is that I have people whose full-time job is shelters. They can't really work from home and to ask other people to do their work puts their jobs at risk. If I can figure out a way to get this work done, by pulling in people from other departments, I am literally putting these people out of work. That's, that's not an option. Um, you know, as a head of access services, we are handling physical materials. That's part of what we do. Um, anybody, I, I have colleagues who have offered to come in and help out or did during the pandemic when we were locked down. Um, and many of them did, but I don't wanna put my people out of jobs. So the idea that um, we should divide this up and make it fair to everybody is not realistic. Um, and, and thinking about it that way is actually more harmful than helpful. Um, like I said, I've, I've made a lot of efforts to allow my staff some time from home, take a mental health day, um, spend half of a day doing this LinkedIn learning course, which then I can describe to my superiors as work. Um, but no, I, I really can't change the job so that it's, I mean, they do some other things, but all of it requires them to handle physical materials. Um, it's, it's an entry level position. I work really hard with them to move them up. But that's the job they were hired to do. It's the job they took and I don't have other work for them. Sorry. Right. That's... Thank, thanks for your comment. Um, so I'll ask uh, our speakers, do y'all want to address that? Um, I could probably attempt to address it. Um, like I said, I am head of user services and we are kind of facing a lot of issues in terms of telecommuting and making sure that people have work to do during their telecommuting hours. Um, it's more so, I mean, we haven't had an issue where a job is 100%, like it, everything has to be done on site. So I think we've gotten um, pretty lucky there and that we've been able to identify things that can be done from home. Um, and 
we, I think in a situation where it is 100% in person, we have had to do uh, varying telecommuting schedules where some people can work, can tele telework more than others. Um, and it is still a really difficult situation to navigate because of, you know, trying to be fair to everyone and make sure everyone can have the same amount of telecommuting days, but it's just really not, um, it's just not reasonable considering when you look at people's PVs and think, think about the things that they can do. And we actually work with them directly to talk about those. Like, okay, according to your, to your PD, this, these are the things that we see that you can do from home. And these, this percent is what you can do, what needs to be done on site. And so based on that, this is what we can do in terms of telecommuting. Um, and honestly, it's kind of like, that's the job that you have and that's the way that we can work it out. If you want to telecommute more, um, you know, maybe there's a position that can come open in the library in the future that you may apply for uh, that would allow for more telecommuting. That's kind of what it comes down to. And other than that, it's just a matter of working with them to say, hey, are there, is there any work that you feel like you could do telecommuting that would contribute to what you have in your PD? Um, and when it comes to shelving, yeah, like LinkedIn learning, I agree. Like, opportunities for professional development is really most of what what it would come to. Um, and any any sort of maybe collection review that they can do online, but I'm not really thinking of any right now. So I definitely feel your pain there. And Yvonne or Lolly, did you want to add anything to um, what Holly has experienced and her response to Andrea's comment? Well, the main thing I would say is, is it sounds like you're already doing this. Number one, I don't have a magic solution, but number two, the sheer act of engaging closely with those folks um, makes the most sense and finding what do they ultimately want to do. But sometimes th that's what you're experiencing is exactly it. What they were employed to do requires on-site work. My husband works for UPS throughout the pandemic. He had to work in a get up every day and work in a warehouse shoulder to shoulder with folks. There is no option to work <laughs> from home when you're delivering packages. And so that was his, his job. And so, and I'm trying to say it in a way that is with compassion and with empathy, but really fundamentally, I found that simply working with our department and individuals, it is a long, tough slog. I do not envy Holly um, in her unit. She's got 14, 15 folks with very different works with def very different jobs and it's such a variety. Whereas in um, my department of teaching and learning, it's a, more of a straightforward um, uh, environment. So really at the end of the day, it just involves that human to human interaction to identify possible solutions. And you may just not come up with something that works for the nature of the job and the human being that's attached to that job. Um. Another thing that many people have said, and this I think can come out through those relational conversations as well, not everybody wants to work remotely. Like I'm, I'm not, I don't choose to be at home every day, even though my actual in-person work needs may not require me to be here, but I prefer being in the office some days, like many other people do as well, even if they don't have on-site work requirements. Um, and so having that conversation across the board, providing spaces for those people to continue to do their work in wherever, whichever organization, organization you're in is also important. So it's, um, we don't want to go the other way, which is what I think um, some of our earlier Q&A addressed, this idea that um, we can't let go of every single structure necessarily because we're not calling for anarchy here, but instead we're talking about more collaborative co-created processes. And um, if, for Andrea, I think um, a point to your question, yes, sometimes the jobs are 100% in work. Like if your job is to shelve materials all of the time, that requires, oh, and I don't know if you said shelving, but I think that's what you said, um, but that requires you to be here in the shelves, right? Um, but is that the, is there a way to um, think about how, if those people want to be able to work remotely, is there a way to um, come up with a plan for transitioning into a different position? Um, is there, or even if it's not like tomorrow, but like some sort of transition plan for them to make that. The other thing that I saw on Twitter 
the last couple of days throughout this conference is this idea of clarity and transparency. And transparency doesn't necessarily tell pe mean telling people every single thing, but it does mean being clear from the start about expectations. So I would imagine including in um, these, these shelving jobs, right? Being clear that it requires in-person work. So part of what we're feeling is this pain point that we're changing from the majority of people were like they signed up for one type of job and then a lot of other people's jobs were able to change so now there's this is an equity how can we address those changes um there was one other point i want to make about that but i think i am i have lost it but <laughs> just um, making sure that we're super clear with these expectations and that people know what they're signing up for before they get to that point i think is important oh i know um Lots of times when job ads, we'll see kind of like a blanket statement about what the workplace is like, and it may say something like, our workplace values uh, um, the telecommuting options, provides telecommuting options for our employees, or blah, 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 blah. We want to make sure that we're not selling ourselves as something that may not be accurate for a lot of, or even some, or one person in our library. How can we reflect uh, the true nature of what the work might be? Okay, there is a lot going on in the chat, and I think we're going to take maybe the Q&A questions first, because I'm going to um, hopefully assume that the chat are people who are more in conversation with one another. And let's see. Uh, okay, this top one here. So what responsibility do you see for faculty to use their agency to dismantle the bureaucracies they influence through shared governance? Um, recognizing that not every organization is working in this structure, but I think for a lot of you, you are. It isn't just management slash universities who define all the bureaucracies being described in the presentations, 100%. Some of these can fall under the systems built by library faculty themselves in their shared governance of themselves. For example, tenure slash promotion criteria can sometimes be defined by the faculty themselves. Does anyone, any of my colleagues want to address that? We um, saw that question and uh, the four of us were talking among ourselves. So we, um, the library faculty here in the CSU, the California State University system, our faculty were tenure track faculty. And so one of the first things we did uh, that summer, the first pandemic summer, is we took a, a long look at our retention and tenure and promotion standards. And Talitha really, credit where it's due, uh, pushed us to look at this. We are, as you might imagine, a workforce that is um, predominantly women and also predominantly caretakers for children and other family members. And so many of us uh, quickly recognize that continuing with our expected uh, research productivity and professional productivity in an environment with um, our, the folks that we care for around us just wasn't possible. So to answer this question, what we did was we actually initiated a revision of our tenure standards that resulted in a completely separate appendix to our tenure standards um, that went through our academic senate um, as appropriate. And actually it was the first of its kind in our university and it resulted in a number of colleges departments going forward and making um, changes to their tenure standards as well. And the specific change we made is we actually reduced the number of uh, research products um, for a particular period of time. And I don't remember the details off the top of my head, but we had some very specific language about a reduction in expectations. Well, and just to be clear, um, while we reduce the number of publications that were required for anyone who was going up for tenure during, if they were hired during or were employed during the COVID pandemic, that it wasn't a reduction in expectations, but a recognition that there was more work to be done. So we were um, ensuring that the, our document reflected what work people needed to be doing and wanted to be doing to um, help contribute to the mission of the library that we all agreed upon was important. The other thing that a lot of places, uh, a lot of universities, they uh, allowed people to put a pause on their tenure clock. Okay, so we know that this stuff is hard right now, so go ahead and take a an extra year to get tenure. But we know that looking, we could have guessed, and also we know, looking back at what has happened over the last couple of years, that um, women were 
disproportionately tasked with picking up the additional like homeschooling, caretaking, all of that during the COVID pandemic. It, if they were working at home, oftentimes doing it simultaneously while working full time. Um, so putting that, allowing people that extra year, okay, good, you don't lose your job right away, but more women would take advantage of that extra year, which going down the line, we see has compounding effects on salaries, on whether or not they get promoted, all of these things. And just like, I'm, I'm super burned out, everyone. Like two years of that much hard work was tiring. And I had tenure, so I can't imagine how it was for folks who were uh, going up through this process at the same time. Okay. Oops, did I do the right one? Okay, yep. Um, okay, this next one is a question that is near and dear to my heart. So do you have ideas about how to use organizing uh, in parentheses unions as a proactive tool to combat new managerialism and for managers who to work collaboratively with union represented employees to find creative solutions that are equitable? Um, before I go on, do any of my colleagues want to address this question? No, go ahead, Talitha. Okay, so I am um, on our campus's union executive board for CSUSM. Um, so I work pretty closely with the union. Just later on today, I'm gonna to be meeting with our campus administration about some labor management issues that we've been having. So this, uh, and again, as a reminder, the new managerialist new managerialism is an application of uh, like corporate, structures and emphasis on the bottom line to organizations where we should be mission driven rather than uh, bottom line profit driven. Okay, so the application of that corporate mindset. So part of it is um, rethinking what success means. What does, how, what does it look like when we achieve our goals? What does it look like when we achieve our missions? So, um, Maybe it is the completion of a project or the completion of X, Y, Z, but how can we come together and agree on what that is? So rather than success being defined for a reference librarian as X number of hours at the reference desk, it's instead a reflective conversation that takes into uh, the, the person's experience of what they had, how they're uh, grappling with what they want to change, what they want to improve, um, feedback to the administration on how that can be changed, rather than saying, you're not getting promoted, you were here 10% less at the reference desk than someone else, which I know none of you are doing, right? But if we, if we boil down the managerialism, it's um, how do we work together on that? So that's more on a one-on-one -on -one level, but the union that I would say organizing, what that takes into account is that how we work together collectively. How do we as a group of library workers who are represented by a union, how do we all agree what's important to us and how do we help the university better accomplish its mission in a way that respects people as people and workers. So respects workers as people. We all want our students to receive an education that they agree upon that is what they want to receive. And we could go into like a, like a liberatory mindset of what we want that to look like, but that's kind of like, uh, that's I'm sure other people are presenting on that at this conference. Um, but how do we as a collective work together to help the university not stray too far into to not overemphasize the bottom line in those widgets. Because yes, some things need to be counted. How many students are enrolled in classes? How many people are, um, how many hours are we able to be open? Okay, but do those necessarily correlate with quote unquote success? Um, how can managers work collaboratively with union represented employees? Um, I'm, I'm going to feel like an open or a broken record, but it's having those conversations again, keeping in mind what are the requirements of your collective bargaining agreement. Um, and seeing it as 
an opportunity, a benefit to your employees to have this protection rather than an obstacle when you're coming up with new policies or um, new projects that you envision. So you come up with a new project. If, um, if administration just like announces it as something that has to happen, I can guarantee you, and I'm sure you've all experienced immediate resistance, right? Um, and again, this is like, thinking about my kid, lots of times it's not actually resistance to the idea, it's resistance that she was not able to have a say in coming up with what that looked like. If I had like, and, and we also want to make sure we don't have our predetermined idea, we want to let go of what our predetermined idea for the project is and go in with an open mind about like, this is what I imagine, what do you imagine? Is there a way that you think that we can make it better and how can we accomplish this as a group? And everyone being on the same page about what it means to be a collective is super important because we don't want you as managers to be burnt out and have horrible lives either. You're workers too. How can we all work together so that all of us have our lives and that we're not, um, work does not overshadow every other aspect of who we are and what we do. Let's see, the next question I see, so to all, is it better to push for change within the bureaucratic system of power using the system itself or ignore that system and make changes on our own, meaning make change within the library environment? This is a hard question. What is it? I don't have a... Talita, oh, actually, I just wanted to note there was another question that came in and I, I typed the answer, oh, sure. so it went over to answered, but... Um, it says slightly off topic, how do folks define a middle manager? I've seen library directors attending library directors attending this conference identifying that way, but I would say that it's upper management. So I just said that I believe that anyone who has a manager above them could technically consider themselves a mi middle manager. Um, I think it's sort of flexible, right? So in the case where I'm making the decision, the final decision, maybe it starts and ends with me. I could be the you know, upper management to some people in that case. Um, in decisions where there's someone above me making that final decision, then I'm the middle manager. So in most cases, I'm the middle manager in my current position. So that's why I define myself as the middle manager. Um, I definitely think that from the perspective of a library director or library dean is what I could really speak to is that they may consider themselves middle managers because in a lot of cases they have to report to the provost or the vice provost or the president, right? And so they are being told to get things done from those folks and then they have to make that happen. So they are sometimes not the, there are sometimes not even the people who want to do those things, but as a library dean or a library director, they have to represent those things. So. Um, and they need to make it happen because they've been told to. So in that case, they are middle managers. So it definitely is very flexible and dependent on the situation. But I just say I'm a middle manager because in most cases, um, there are people above me who could say, no, don't want to do that, change your decision, do something else, figure something else out. Um, so I think that it's just flexible. If I can try and tackle the question about, is it better to push for change within the bureaucratic system of power or ignore the system? Um, I say this as a very tired person, <laughs> but do both. Um, one of the things I start I started from the time I started working here at, at Cal State San Marcos is I was part of our academic Senate. And I have sat through many hours of Senate meetings, participated on many committees. And uh, this year is the first year of two years of being the chair of the Academic Senate. And I have found that the Academic Senate has been an incredibly exclusionary, problematic environment. And one that because of my experience, I can work towards improving. The Senate will not fix everything though. There's all sorts of other work to be done outside of these formal governance structures. And so I'm interested in that as well. So my suggestion is, um, and something I tell people is, the rules around us are constructed by humans and there's humans that enforce them and there's humans that can change them, but it is slow. And it also requires you to do your homework, to pay attention, do the reading. Um, and that's something I've noticed in Senate that the folks that do the reading and prepare um, are often the ones that are able to um, counteract some of the exclusionary and problematic uh, practices and values. I hope that makes sense to folks, but that's something I feel very important. Do the reading, exactly.
Okay. Um, one other thing I just wanted to clarify, because I realized it could be, uh, I could have come off the wrong way. Um, although I used my daughter as an example, I do not think that library workers are children. Like it's not a child parent relationship there. Um, I was more trying to highlight how all people, including children who are people, feel when they don't have a when they don't have agency in a decision that they're expected to um, conform to. So just to make sure I'm clear, uh, I don't think that people should be treating other people like children or more the flip side is that children should also be treated with respect, <laughs> you know, not that we shouldn't pe treat people like children. Um, Okay, there did Danny, did you say we have one time for one more question? Or are we all do we have to wrap up? I think uh, we are unfortunately pretty much at time. Um, if y'all want to share your resources, I think that would be amazing. Okay, sure. Um, let me go to the next slide. Um, and we can I think we'll give you our link to our slides, Danny. Will these be available on the website? Yes, yeah, so we can put them on. Oh, the music's coming back. Um, we can put them on our uh, OSF instance after the conference. We'll also be uploading this uh, recording as soon as possible so that y'all can share it with your colleagues and have a good discussion for those folks who couldn't be here. Uh, Moya has put a link in the chat to our evaluation. We did notice that SCED is not sending out the evaluations after the session. So um, please, uh, just a reminder to go ahead and give us that feedback. Um, we really appreciate it. It helps us plan our further years of conferences. And just a huge, huge thank you to Holly, Yvonne, to Lisa, and Lolly. Um, what a great presentation. Thanks for setting us up for the second half of the conference um, and wishing everybody a good rest of your conference day.